Hello and welcome to A Four Wheels Good, where John Stanley gives you all you need to know to start your appreciation of the legendary Ferrari mark. My guest this week is from Michelin Tyres, and I believe he's going to be colour coordinated. Also, Will Hoy will be zapping around Alton Park in an M3 Evolution. But first off, Nicky Fox and I discovered a slower mode of transport, but at least ours could get over the hills. When you buy a Jeep, you get two tugs at the heartstrings. 55 years ago, your granddad may have driven one deep into World War II. The second tug comes from Chrysler, who now own the Jeep name. They've kept that rugged image going non-stop so that you can safely become a peacetime hero. This week, nose to tail, the Willis MB Jeep and the 1997 Jeep Wrangler Sahara, codenamed TJ. This is the real thing. Built in 1943 and used by the British Army, it could have been around on D-Day. You can spend a lot of time on roads looking for a permitted place to test the off-roading capability. So let's start this inspection on the blacktop. In 1943, acceleration like this was considered phenomenal and the three gears got you up to a cruising speed of 45 miles an hour. Although they do say that John Wayne could push his to 55. With a ride like this, you need true grit and a back brace. Mind you, it handles really well, with incredibly responsive steering that just dares you to chuck it around. And all these were left-hand drive, presumably so you can enjoy driving on the continent. After the war, civilians quickly became soft, and general criticisms of all generations of Jeep was that they were too spartan, too harsh on the road. So, half a century on, Chrysler is finally introducing coil-sprung suspension. And it helps a lot, though, on less than silken roads. You still retain that short wheelbase feel of a well-sprung rocking horse. Still, a long and leggy fifth gear smooths things out very nicely on the motorway. Just 2,000 revs at 70. And as for speed, that old-fashioned four-litre up there would top 100 with ease for those mad and bad enough to risk their licence. Side by side, you can see how carefully the signature of the original survives. The grille, the rounded headlights, the distinctive bumpers. The star on the bonnet? Well, that was to let the Allied pilots know whose side you were on. In 1991, Jeep made a big styling mistake, which triggered off an American t-shirt protest. Real Jeeps don't have square headlights. Round is original, so they'll be back for 97. Most of the changes are about retro body styling. You'll be able to buy one of these top of the rangers for about £16,500. Fully restored, you should be able to pick one of these up for about £6,000. Points of interest, well, you get luxury upholstery and a free shovel. Actually, the driver sits on top of the petrol tank, so if you are getting shot at, this shovel could come in very handy. Nothing is adjustable, ah, except for the driver's breathing. And if you're looking for the windscreen wipers, there they are. Still, pull that, start that, and with a bit of luck, off we go. 97 style brings with it the roll cage and this hardtop option, which retains a certain fish tank feel from previous models for maximum sunshine. I can only hope that this one's easier to remove than the dreadful old one, because in this weather, that feature will remain untested, for me anyway. For the technical among you, the pulling power of the vintage model comes from a 2.2 litre side valve, that 63 brake horsepower and a torque or grunt factor of 105 foot-pounds. Now with an engine almost twice as big, the Wrangler has twice the torque and 174 brake horsepower. It feels like it. Of course there's high and low ratio 4x4, but my favourite feature is this gearbox. It's straight down for first, reminds me of the old Ford Pop, but if there's any trouble ahead, Back it straight up for reverse, and off you go backwards. Where's that shovel? Nicky and I having four wheels fun. Now mention another F word, the word Ferrari, and you probably think of lottery winners, flash football stars and snooty dealers who sneer at you when you dare to peek into their showrooms. But owning a genuine Ferrari may not be as far out of your reach as you might imagine. Here's John Stanley. Until recently, I really thought Lafro was just a spot on the map. I didn't know it at all. Now I find that it's not just a centre for bingo and ordinary community life, but it is also a lot to do with motor cars. I recently met an interesting man who, in the 60s here, actually developed a little car called the Titchy, which Stirling Moss proved to actually 
indoors. Then I find that a recent road test Punto has seats that were designed at Loughborough University. Suddenly it seems Loughborough is on the motoring map. And indeed that is the case, but it is a much more serious story than titchy cars from the 60s. It is in fact the epicentre to a revolution that is going on with Italian exotica. In the past, Ferrari dealerships have had a reputation for being rather more filled with arrogance in the showroom than they have motor cars that you've been allowed to buy. The other side of this glass, there are three good reasons why Loughborough has aided the new revolution. The first reason is that four years ago Ferrari UK gained themselves a new managing director and he vowed and pledged that elitism would be removed and that the whole dealership process would be refocused. Secondly, this dealership is owned by Frank Sittner, the motor racing ace, and the relationship that he has with his race mechanics is one of trust and of freedom, and they rely on each other. And he has brought exactly the same team spirit to this distinct Ferrari dealership. As a result, Greypool has become the number one retailer for second-hand Ferraris in the country. And all this has been led by a mercurial man from Naples called Mario. And in here, before we meet the man, you can see his passion for Ferrari is seriously deep. He doesn't just sell them, he lives them. If you look here, he's got photographs of himself, He's got Schumacher's signature. He's got cartoons. The rich and famous who've bought from him. He even has his own helmet, a works helmet with his name on it. He is the ultimate salesman for Ferrari because he believes in them, he loves them. He admits it's unlikely he would ever afford one, but that doesn't seem to make any difference. In here, he has the ultimate secret weapon. He actually uses a CD of V12 Ferraris to inspire him and the sales force. Somebody in the factory is very lucky. We try and run a very family-oriented business um, in the respect of, you know, I was brought up in the back streets of Loughborough and I remember 10 years ago when um, I used to look through the showroom windows, I daren't come in here because I thought the attitude of Ferrari owning Ferraris was something that I'd never get. So, uh, and that was, the th that was the main thing I wanted to change. When I first came in here, I wanted to open the doors to everybody. I've been in the car industry for about 10 years. Um, and I've got to say, I was here for six months, seven months. And to me, it was just another job. It was just another job selling cars until one day I realized that I'd actually fallen in love with the product. And that is the difference. Um, it is just not another job. You actually fall in love with the product. The Ferrari has something about it that you just grasp hold of it and you can't let it go. Um, now I've had a reasonable turnover of staff. I'm not going to pretend that I haven't. And the reason I've usually found that the turnover of staff has been is not because they've been good salesmen or bad salesmen. Um, it's not that they've not earned any money or anything. It's that they haven't, actually, they haven't actually fallen in love with the product. And you usually find that if somebody falls in love with the product and actually likes doing what they do, that will make them. That's when they fit in here. And we find that the team that we've got in here now, um, they are all true, passionate Ferrari lovers. Um, and, and that's the reason they fit in. So I don't think there is a thing. I can't train somebody to fall in love with Ferrari. Um, and I don't think there is a necessary... You don't need to necessarily be a fantastic salesman to actually do this job. I think that you've got to actually understand Ferrari and just be passionate. I keep using the word passionate, and I suppose that you can, it can go over the top a little bit, but it's how I actually feel about the product, and I usually find that everybody that I work with is, is no different. There's certainly a general love affair with Ferrari, and it's well beyond just being a motor car. It is a way of life. It's a sort of icon. When people aspire to consider one or flirt with the idea, the, the, general, the general trend is to see there's a Ferrari 400 or a 308 GT4, which is relatively cheap and could just be affordable. Is that a wise way in, or does one have to be more careful? The 308, for me, that is an exciting little car. 
And that is a car. You know, you'd, you wouldn't be embarrassed of owning a £30,000 308. I certainly wouldn't. Uh, and that is a true sports car for me. It goes back to the same shape as Magnum, and everybody remembers it. And it, I do actually like the 308. And the 400, it's a very, very nice car for somebody that's got a couple of children. Um, that's one of the problems with Ferrari, is it's mainly a two-seater. So, you know, to get a two plus two, it's superb. It's th it cuts out whether, you know, you need to worry about whether... Uh, you've got two children or not, you can still use it and because it's still a sports car. At the end of the day, it's still a Ferrari. These cars, for, you know, people say that they're very expensive and it's all right, but if you can afford to buy one, it's all right buying one, but it's actually running one. It's a myth. They actually don't understand that the cost of running a car isn't very expensive at all. In a respect of, compared to the other half's car, um, you know, if you looked at a 308, you'd have to do the cam belts on a 308 every three years. Well, if you averaged that over the three-year period, it would be about £400 a year. Uh, a service, you'd probably only do one service a year and that would cost you £400. If you split that over the three period, you're looking at maybe £800 a year, which is not over the top to run a car of that calibre. Well, as you gather, Mario is a very passionate salesman and he will never seemingly sell you anything that he doesn't believe in and love. John Stanley, who will be back in future weeks to drive some exciting old and new Ferrari machines. After the break, we'll discover how Michelin have cracked that problem that has kept the tyre industry awake at night for years, the holy grail of the fully coloured tyre. <music> Hello and welcome back. Are you the kind of person who, if offered the keys to a slick, high-performance car for the day, would say, oh, no, thanks very much, I'm perfectly happy with my Toyota Starlet. Oh, dear, well, I'll have to give these to Will Hoy. <laughs> one of the road cars that racing drivers queue up to drive. It's BMW's M3 Evolution. M stands for Motorsport 3 for 3 Series, and Evolution means that BMW have been trying to recreate the glory of the original, now classic, BMW M3 of 1987. A terminal velocity of 155 miles an hour. 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds, and stunning brakes. 60 to standstill in just 2.8 seconds. In fact, the brakes are so good, you'd be wise to keep an eye on your rearview mirror just in case the guy behind you is about to ruin your no claims bonus. This car is the nearest you're going to get to driving a British Touring Car Championship car on the road. I think BMW found themselves a bit of a niche in the market. This car, in this trim, is £43,000. And there really is no other competition at this price level. The nearest is the old style Jaguar XJS 4 litre at around £45,500. Now, the supercar class doesn't even start till you get to the entry level Porsche 911, and that's £60,000. So what we've got here is a bit of a bargain basement supercar. And what's more, it's a Grand Tourer. It's got four seats and a boot. OK, it's a bit understated, and it doesn't have the looks of a normal supercar. But that's no bad thing if you want to avoid the attentions of the boys in blue. It may be the poor man's supercar. But at this price, you're not exactly going to be skinned, and you're certainly going to expect something special. And if you are tight-fisted, well, you can always opt for the coupe at a mere £37,000. The real soul of this car is BMW's classic six-cylinder engine, now reworked to produce 321 eager Bavarian horses. They're whipped up and reined in by high-tech electronics and the infinitely variable camshafts. That's a lot of grunt, but even so, you do need to push the car hard to get real performance. However, there is a flip side, and that's the sound of the 3.2-litre engine under full power. I'm a racing driver, so unless you're as mad as a hatter, this car really is as safe as houses. But it will still get the adrenaline to flow. 
I'm in deepest Cheshire at Alton Park, a twisty and demanding circuit, so I have to use all six gears to hustle the car around. I prefer the sequential shift myself, which is an option on this range, since it's not only quicker, but it's what I'm used to in my race car. Dislikes? Well, the main one has to be the steering. Not only does the wheel feel too large, but it also feels overgeared. And then the column itself is just not fully adjustable. On an all too typical public road with its bumps and potholes, this car tends to shake and rattle a bit. That's probably because it doesn't have the stiffness of the saloon or coupe versions. However, it's as sure-footed as a centipede. Overall, well, yes, there are one or two flaws, but it's a great buy and practical with it. And best of all, it has sizzling supercar performance. Which M3? Well, the converter was a lot of fun, but you certainly need the sun. So I think I'd save myself a bit of money and I'd go for the coupe. Will Hoy with the amazing BMW M Evolution. And I was with him on the day we filmed that and I can tell you it's a great car to drive. When you're tearing around a racetrack like Alton Park, you're more aware than ever of the power of good tyres to keep you on the ground, especially on the bends. Alan Abercrombie from Michelin has just joined me in the studio right now. And Alan, I know you've cracked this age-old problem of getting away from the traditional black tyre. But how have you done it? Because it's made out of carbon and carbon is black. Well, carbon black is there purely and simply to give the tyre some resistance to abrasion and wear. Uh, new tyres, new technology tyres, the energy tyre from Michelin, uses silica as an as a agent to stop this um, uh, abrasiveness. Right, we can see some pictures of them now. And they obviously look very interesting and, and, and naturally colourful. Sure. But, but what about performance and durability and safety? The, the tyre behaves in exactly the same way as what one would call a normal tyre. The fact that it's using silica, and silica is a, a neutral colour, we can colour that tyre any, any colour we like. But the tyre performs in exactly the same way, the same grip, the same mileage, the same water clearance. Everything about the tyre is the same, except that it's coloured. But why, what's the point of having a coloured tyre? What's the point of having colour-coordinated bumpers and colour-coordinated wing mirrors? Uh, there may be people out there, and we're testing it on, in the market at the moment, who would like to be able to enhance their car in various ways by have a co having colour-coordinated tyres. Will they cost a lot more? There'll be a slight premium on them, but not a lot more, perhaps 5 10%, something so like that. Take that as a yes, then? Oh, you take it as a yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what kind of cars will we see them on, do you think? Mainly on the, the fashion-type cars, the Twingos, the Ford cars, those type of things. People that um, have a, a small uh, car which, if you like, shows their, their personality. The posers. The posers. The posers like. and the hairdressers. Um, the crimpers. <laughs> yes. And, and not the health visitors and teachers. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yes. Uh, what is in the coloration, though? I mean, you, you talk about silica, but what exactly is it? Silica is a, a natural formed substance that is along the line of sand, I suppose, in, in some instances. But uh, it's used because. Tyres now have a lower rolling resistance. Everything is, is towards economy. Uh, we've gone a long way towards giving extra mileage with the radial tyre. With economy now, we're looking at fuel consumption. And low rolling resistance tyres give you extra miles per gallon. What colours can we get? You, what colour do you want? You can, you can order your colour to match anything at all. Well, I, uh, I suppose the more... Uh, you order, the more expensive they become. If right. you want a one-off striped tyre, perhaps we can do it for you. But and that's uh, not a concept, that's a reality at the moment. That's a reality. There are cars in Europe, on a test market in France, Germany and Italy, running around on coloured tyres. But a concept that you are working on is a tyre that can run flat, essentially. Tell me about that. Yes, we've just uh, shown to the world uh, a tyre called the vertically anchored tyre, which is a new concept of uh, connecting the tyre to the wheel. And by that concept the, the concept, the tyre is in fact clipped onto the wheel, not retained on the wheel by the air pressure within the tyre. So if you lose air pressure, the tyre remains on the rim and you can run on for 130 miles at 55 miles an hour or up to 55 miles an hour to get to wherever you want for the tyre to be repaired or in some instances to a place of safety. There was a bit of a hoo-ha in the States, wasn't there, when uh, Bill Cosby's son was killed changing a tyre. Now, has this initiative come out of that kind of incident, or is it something that tyre manufacturers were working on anyway? 
we, we've always been working on that type of uh, concept, but uh, I suppose one can say that the Cosby incident has accelerated the, the demand for that type of tyre, and we see that uh, it will be a big seller in the States. In Europe it will come later, but it's, it's a glimpse of the future as far as we're concerned. Right. There must be some drawbacks, though. There are some drawbacks in as much as you have to have a special wheel and a special tyre um, combination. Uh, the tyre is slightly heavier. There is a, a slight decrease in uh, ride comfort, perhaps. Maneuverability as well, presumably. No, no, the maneuverability is in, enhanced, in fact, because you shorten the wall and the tyre is much more responsive to steering efforts and cornering uh, uh, side forces. So, yes, there's a great leap forward as far as maneuverability and handling is concerned. The small drawback from that is perhaps a slight decrease in the comfort levels. How far away are we from seeing it on the roads on production cars? Uh, you will see car production cars appearing on this tyre at the end of 1998. Right, so we're around the corner. It's around the corner, but that's not going to change the whole industry overnight, no. just like that. OK, Alan, thanks. We'll leave it there before you get tired. <laughs> OK. <laughs> tired. <laughs> Once again, it's time to visit the workshop of the man who'll feel at home, not just changing his tyres, but virtually every component before breakfast. John Wright. Right. It actually fits from this side. Just in there. Beggar off little fly. Tighten the vice up a bit. Right. Now this is the noisy bit. With a little hammer, gently tap it in. Fairly important it goes in straight. As you can see, this is a fully sealed bearing. I'll just use a drift and get it tapped in. This is a fully sealed bearing. There's no reason or no requirement to grease it. You can normally tell when bearings are fitted because the note changes as you hit it with a hammer. I don't know if the camera and the mic pick that up, but there was a, a different ring as the uh, as the bearing finally hit home a little bit of dust out pair of circlip pliers right squeeze the circlip in pop it down and it goes right we'll just uh, degrease it because as you know when they manufacture the brake drums they put a protective coating over uh, all the surfaces that they've machined to protect them so they look pretty when you get them and they don't go rusty. But when you're using them with brakes, that's got to be got rid of. And we're using the brake cleaner again to do that. You squirt it in there. Really, proper brake cleaner is the only thing that you should be using. And more insider tips, literally, from John Wright next week here on Four Wheels Good. But from all the team for now, ta and safe motoring. <laughs> <laughs>